1979, and now Jody and Jeffrey are now broken up. Now, leave it to Unsung, it was still amicable. There was no concerns. They still had mad respect for each other after the breakup. Answer no. Jody Watley said that that is bullshit. to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to my success here on the YouTube. And if you are not a part of our Patreon Bella Book Club, please hit the link below and for a small $5 monthly fee, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before YouTube gets it, if YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about TV One's Unsung Shalimar. Now first let me tell you this, Shalimar is one of my most favorite groups of all time. One, it reminds me of my youth. Two, they had a dance groove that surpassed the best of them. And I thought that Jeffrey Daniel and Jody Watley were the cutest dance couple. But hold tight. So the show opens up in 1988 at the Grammys where Jody Watley has just won her Best New Artist Award. Okay. The narrator says that Jody Wally is far from a best new artist and that she has been a part of a group called Shalimar for 10 years. Their career started back in the 70s, okay, and catapulted from the infamous Soul Train. Each member spoke of their love of the show. Okay, Jody Watley talked about how she loved the show over there in the Midwest and watched it at 12 o'clock every Saturday. I think on the West Coast, y'all watched it at 11 o'clock every Saturday. Me uh, in DC, we watched it at five o'clock every Saturday on Channel 5. I don't know what it is, but y'all, just for a bonding experience, just tell me what time, channel, and what day the Soul Train came on for you. And, and listen, you huzzies that want to be different, nobody's talking to you. Oh, I never watched Soul Train. What the fuck? How you a black ass woman or a black ass man and you ain't never watched the Soul Train? You know, some of you bitches be so pressed to be different, but eh, I digress. Jeffrey so, Daniels talked about how he was a native of Los Angeles, okay? How he got on the show was he had a friend that was already a part of the Soul Train dance gang, right? So what he did was, a uh, friend, can you get me on the show? They let him on the show, right? But he was just supposed to sit down. He was just supposed to sit down. Oh, that's the Lord talking to me. Saying, Nay, be good. Don't be mean. Be good, baby. All Jeffrey Daniel was supposed to do was sit his ass down and watch. Okay, answer no. Jeffrey Daniels pop locked his ass onto the dance floor and he made it. Now, Jody Watley got on the show before Jeffrey Daniels did. Okay, Jody Watley got on the show was eventually her family ended up moving to California, right? And she would try to sneak on the show. Sometimes she would get on the show, but they would always catch her and be like, get your bony ass up out of here, okay? We tired of putting your ass out, but eventually they let her on. And the two, Jeffrey Daniels and Jody Watley, were eventually paired up as dance couples. I didn't know that either. I didn't know that they were paired up on purpose. Like I said okay. Jody Watley and Jeffrey Daniels were a fan favorite. They loved them as uh, dance partners and eventually we loved them as boyfriend and girlfriend. Now this is the part that TV One Chop where I be having to, you know, give y'all the business for because if you're not going to tell the whole truth, don't control the narrative to make it look the way that you want to look so that somebody else looks bad or good or whatever. But anyway, this is what happened. So Jody Watley ended up doing her own unfiltered about unsung. Okay, and she said that TV One did press the issue of those two, meaning Jeffrey and Jody, being boyfriend and girlfriend. What they left out was that the relationship was tumultuous. Jody Watley said that her relationship with Jeffrey Daniels was physically 
and verbally abuse said damn jeffrey daniels but i would love to say something right here but i'm not gonna say it fuck it i'm gonna say it when you have men that's not really sure of their sexuality they are very, very misogynistic towards women. They are very, very abusive, whether they're cheating on them regularly, uh, physically abusing them, or verbally abusing them, musing them. It's because they're not happy with themselves. Now enters the new dance craze, disco. Y'all know I love me some disco. It will be go-go first. Then it will be disco. Why? Because that motherfucker made you move. I wasn't fat. When disco was out. I don't think nobody was fat when disco was out. Because everybody was dancing. Now Don Cornelius and Dick Griffey. Or Griffin. Or Gregory uh, D Ditto. Whatever his name. I'm just going to call him Dickie. Okay. Don D and his partner Dickie. Decided that they want to do a record label. Okay. It was going to be called Soul Train Records. They okay. cut a Soul Train Gang album. Okay. It produced a minor hit. Okay. And then an independent producer from the Middle East came to Dickie and Don D and said, uh, yeah, I got this song. Do you want it? It's called Uptown Festival. I'm sure it's going to be a hit. I mean, you can have it if you want it. Now, okay. hence where Shalimar got their name from. Because the producer was from the Middle East, they came up with the name Shalimar to pay homage to the producer. So now they had a song, a hit, but no group. They recruited a dude by the name of Gary Mumford, okay? Then they later added on Jody and Jeffrey, all right? The song Uptown Festival was a hit. Jody Watley said that she remembered getting $500. It's not a lot of money now, but back then it was a lot of money, okay? I would say that $500 back then is like three or $4,000. That's still not enough money for what she had to endure. Hold tight, because I'm going to let you know. But um, she didn't have, I guess, the knowledge that she needed to have, but she did admit that she knows that a lot of young artists went through what she went through in regards to being taken advantage of financially. So moving on, Dickie believed in his creation and its potential. Don D say, uh-uh, buy me out. I don't like this, you know, so. Dick Gregory, or not Dick Gregory, over there. Dick E bought Don D out and continued with his, um, you know, aspirations to be a uh, record producer or record exec or whatever it is. Anyway, so once Dickey bought Don Cornelius out, he changed the name of the record label from Soul Train to Solar Records. Sounds of Los Angeles records okay so now gary mumford the lead singer for shalimar wanted out he wanted to go sing for the lord i could dig it most good singers do sing for the lord and so moving on to the next problem you know they don't have a lead singer because you know gary didn't went to go sing for the lord and now dicky don't believe that jody wally could sing I mean, she's not the best singer, but she's not the worst singer ever. She did well for what she did, and she did well enough so that she can get her own thing cranking. So she can eventually convince Dickie. Dickie, I can sing, brother. Solar Records was still in business, okay? But the now lead singer, Gerald Brown, has some concerns with Solar Records, okay? Now, let me break down the problem. The problem was that Gerald Brown was an established singer. And on top of that... Dickey still owed him money for when he participated on the uh, Soul Train Gang album, the first album, okay? Gerald Brown's concern was, I'm an established singer, okay? I need more money, okay? And them two kids over there really ain't doing nothing, okay? Don't tell me that you splitting this money three ways equally when you got two, two kids over there bebopping, shoe whopping. Why they okay. had to show the dude, Gerald said, uh... Tell Dickie when he get my money right, then call me. Until then, stay the fuck out of my face. Enters Howard Hewitt, okay? Now, he's standing up in front of a place called Maverick Flats, okay? Now, Maverick Flats is in Compton, okay? He was singing there once a week, okay, after his family touched down in L.A., okay? Now, it's funny 
We going through Howard Hewitt's upbringing, but we won't go through Jody Watley's and Jeffrey Daniels. Okay, but you know, this is the unsung bullshit I'm talking about right here. Howard so. Hewitt is from Akron, Ohio, and by the time he was 10, his mother figured out that he could sing. Not sing, but sing. That began the uh, journey of the Hewitt singers, okay, until he was 18, until he moved his ass to the Los Angeles and started singing regularly at that place called Maverick Flats. How are you with, yo, he, I told y'all all, all uh, Libra men are weasels, girl, but you know, we gonna find out later, so just hold tight. Jeffrey Daniels was already a part of the Maverick Flats judge because sometimes he would DJ there, sometimes he would dance there, but he was well aware of how are you with, talent okay now the story goes like this okay Howie Hewitt had an interview or a meeting in the Motown building now this is what I didn't know that in the Motown building there were other record labels in the building right so he's sitting at Motown waiting to be seen or to sing or whatever it is that you do when you go to audition at Motown right I'm like for real for real um how will you with you dodge the bullet? Anyway, anyway, he's sitting in the Motown office. The phone's ring. The lady passes him the phone. Hello, uh, how will you with this? Is uh, Jeffrey Daniels, and we need you to come to Solar Records, which is in the same building as Motown, so that you can meet Solar Record exec Dickie. So when Howard Hewitt went downstairs, he sang for Dickie, Peebo Bryson's Feel the Fire. How does that song go? If I if I knew the song, I would sing it for y'all, but I just can't think. Feel me. Is that it? I want to feel the fire. Yeah. Dickie Gregory says, okay, you got it. $500 now. Fly to New York. Okay. Howard Hewitt said he didn't know what the hell was going on. But when he got there, Jeffrey Daniels, and Jody Watley was waiting on him because they had a performance in New York. Jeffrey Daniels said, okay, he go to moves. He go to words. So Howie Hewitt needed to know how to lip sync because take that to the bank wasn't his. That was that dude, Gerald, who told Dickie to kiss his ass. Next, they're in the studio with Leon Silvers, okay? They are working on the album Big Fun. Howard Hewitt, at this point, actually gave Jody Watley her props for having a nice voice. He said that Jody Watley's voice and his voice sounded very well together or very good together. So now here comes the problem. Jody Watley says that her and Howard Hewitt had problems in the beginning, okay? She said that there were respect issues because of her youth. Now, Howard Hewitt responds and says, well, she was a nice girl. I think I even hit on her once or twice. The next thing was she found it inappropriate that the person that she was working with had hit on her. Okay. How would Hewitt, the way that he said it, yeah, I think I, don't, I hit on her once or twice. That was inappropriate, bruh. Why would you do that? You know, you want to deal, with, well, he is, you know, a Libra, and I told you them motherfuckers be weasels. Okay. Uh, it was like but, he was so minimalizing the concerns there. You know, it... Unsung really did paint a picture that Jody Watley was the problem. Like, okay, men have a problem with shame. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't want to hear about their wrongdoings because that shit crushes them. They can't handle us. You know, us women, we go through all kinds of shit. We shit on ourselves when we have babies and every damn thing. We don't give a fuck about no shame. We keep going. Another problem was the choreography, okay? Jody Watley... And Jeffrey Daniels, because they were dancers, you know, they could easily take that to the bank. One, two, move, two, do, do, do. They easily. How he would say by the time he got to the microphone, he was so windy, he could barely sing the song. Ooh, that nigga need to work out. That's why so it's 1979, and Jody Watley and Jeffrey Daniels are now broken up. According to Jeffrey, everything was amicable. Amicable. Okay, there were no problems. Answer, no. Uh, Jody Watley, on her unfiltered, has said, that nigga's a liar, okay? They mentioned that he married Stephanie Mills, but they didn't talk about the entire situation that happened as a result of him marrying Stephanie Mills, okay? 
She said that Jeffrey thought that he was that nigga because number one, the group is getting a whole new set of publicity for a reason not related to the group. Okay, so everybody wants to know who this dude is that married Stephanie Mills because Stephanie Mills is doing very well for herself at the time. Okay, she was a bad motherfucker at four foot five. Okay, oh, I love Stephanie Mills. She's one of my favorite, favorite singers. You hear me? Love. Jody Watley goes on to say it was definitely tension. Okay, she said that there were times where they tore up them dressing rooms because he was being such a bitch. Jody Watley goes on to talk about how Dickie would constantly remind her that girl, you are expendable girl. Don't talk shit to me. Cause you don't really do no singing like that. Okay. You good, but I could bring up a bitch up here that would blow your ass away. Okay. Jody did not like that feeling of being constantly reminded that she was expendable. It's like Dickie wanted to mentally break her down. Okay. Now, because I am a Jody Watley fan, I've never really said why won't she reunite with the group, eh, eh, eh. But whatever her reasons were, I trusted it. The reason why she Dickie was so dismissive of Jody Watley's and Jeffrey Daniels' ability as singers was because he didn't even know that they could sing, okay? He didn't even know. But eventually, they turned out to be a powerful group. And in comes the Disco Sucks movement. You know, I still can't believe that disco left as hard as it did. Like, it was like, I don't know. The universe is so fickle. You know, they love you one day and then they hate you the other. I, I don't get it. Disco makes you dance. Don't you want to dance? In 1980, the group released the album Three for Love. This is for the lover in you this ring. I'll always be true this time it's gonna last forever this took them away from the disco dance group to more of an r&b group because that ballad opened the door for them so jeffrey daniels steps up and say listen i don't want to dress like a triplet no more okay we need to show our individuality okay and you know pop is really big at that time Okay, people want to dress like, you know, Cindy Lauper, I guess. But we're not going to dress like triplets no more. So the next album was the Friends album, okay? And they garnered massive success over in the UK. So at All the right. same time, Dickie was pointing out because he was I, some kind of CEO of the Black Music Association, something like that. And he was saying at the time, which we all have heard before. I know I, just about every book that I have read, they have all said that MTV was not allowing black artists on um, MTV videos, you know, because back then how we looked at videos was we would wait for shows like MTV, Friday Night Videos, uh, what is B, what was BET's thing? I forget the name of it. And, you know, it was just a lot of shows that showcased videos. We didn't have a whole channel that played videos all night and day. I think this, what, did we have Jukebox? No, we didn't even have Jukebox then. And Jukebox is when you could pay to have your favorite video played. Dick Griffey said the first video to be showed on MTV was Michael Jackson. The second was... Um, Shalimar's Night to Remember. And this is what Jody Watley says about the video, A Night to Remember. I feel the same way as her. I don't get it. I, when I was young and I saw it, I didn't pay no attention to it. But now, when I look at it now as an adult, I'm like, why did they have her singing to two different men? And then at the end of the video, she got on the bed with the two men. You know, what the hell was going on? That was degrading for Jody. And I understood why. She was like, I don't understand that video at all. Jeffrey didn't understand the video, and neither did Howard. Here comes the money problems. What you thought? That there wasn't going to be a, a money problem situation? Never. It's always money problems. Jody Watley was saying how she didn't have nothing, okay? She said her mother instilled in her to buy property. My, my mom did too. But um, she said she didn't even have enough money after touring, making, I think they're on their third album now. She didn't even have enough money to put a down payment on the house. So she said, Jody Wally said when she went to Dick Griffey, Griffith, 
Griffo, Dicky, whoever, right? When she went to him and said, this is a concern to me that I don't even have enough money to buy myself a house, okay? Dick said to her, being a dick, said to her, oh, don't worry about no house, girl. You could, I got a big old ranch over there, girl. You can come to my ranch and, and ride my horses and all of that. Jody Wally said, I don't want to ride your horses at your ranch. I want my own ranch and my own horses. Now, Jeffrey Daniels goes on to talk about his money problems, okay? He says that they didn't even own their cars. They were leasing rentals from the company that they work for. I said, what the fuck? Why would you lease the rentals, baby, when you can just go buy your own car? But I guess because they were so young and so engulfed into the music business, I guess they didn't want to take care of their own business, right? So Jeffrey Daniels had some concerns too. Now, this is how he was issued, right? This is when Jody Watley said, now I heard some things, okay? But I didn't know that they was true. So anyway, Howard Hewitt goes on to talk about how he felt like he didn't receive any royalties. Howard Hewitt goes on to talk about how he hasn't been receiving royalties, right? Now notice, Jody Watley says she hasn't received a royalty dime from any of the music she made from Shalimar. Now she says that she made music, money touring, but in regards to the royalties from the songs, Mm -mm. Wait, Howie Hewitt goes on to talk about, okay, I've been torn around here. Where are my royalties at? Okay. This is when Dick Gregory says, why do I keep calling him Dick Gregory? Dick Griffey or Dicky, whoever says, uh, what about that million dollars I gave you, brother? You spent that? That was your money. That was your advance up front. Your royalties were in that million dollar advance. Jody Wally said, I heard about the million dollars, but I didn't know it was true. And why would he give it to Hewitt and not us? So Howard Hewitt is very cavalier about the discrepancies in the group. Jeffrey and Jody, on the other hand, didn't like the way uh, Howard Hewitt was being so pompous about his positioning in the group. Okay. Howard Hewitt knew that he had a lot of power. You know why? Because Dickey gave him that million dollars off the brick. Shalimar continues to thrive overseas, okay? The office poured in and Shalimar declined them all, okay? Howard said he was focusing on trying to put together his failing marriage that ended anyway. And Jody Watley decided to have a baby despite the naysaying. Now, let's do this, okay? Jody Watley tried to tell us that they were trying to force her to terminate the baby. She was trying to tell us that they were trying to manipulate her by saying things like, you're going to destroy the group if you have this baby. Okay? I thought that that was absolutely disgusting. And all the while, Either one of these men could have as many babies as they want because they're not the carrier. But she's not allowed to have a baby, nigga. Now, because Jody was pregnant and Howard was over there trying to work it out with his wife that didn't work any fucking way, okay? That's because he's a Libra, and I told you what, Libra's a weasel. Jeffrey Daniels was the only person who was available to do promo tours over there in the U.K., Okay, because they wanted them some Shalimar, right? So he would go out there and represent for the whole group. Now, while he was over there, he started moonwalking and backsliding his ass all over the place. Okay, he called it the back backslide. Uh, Michael Jackson took it and called it the moonwalk, okay? They loved him overseas. And he loved the admiration. After all, when he was with Shalimar, he was in the background. But when you're Jeffrey Daniels over there backsliding all over the place, then you your own person. In 1983, Shalimar reluctantly got back together, okay, for their seventh album. It was called The Look, okay? Now, because Jeffrey Daniels received so much love in the UK, he told them, motherfucker, I'm not coming back. Now, of course, when you're a part of the group, you have to promote the group, okay? Jeffrey Daniels was a dickhead. 
Okay, Jody Watley said, I don't know why Jeffrey Daniels was on the show pretending like you so hurt and everything when you was the first person to leave the goddamn group. I'm I'm confused. But Jeffrey Daniels said, okay, well, y'all two can do it over in America. When you get over here to the UK, we can do it together over in the UK, you know, since we got so much, you know, love over here in the UK. But you and Jody do it. Jody and Hewitt can do it over there and then when you get here it'll be all three of us okay oh, howie yeah. hewitt and jody watley are finished promoting the new album over in the u.s so now they over there in the uk okay jody watley said jeffrey daniels is still a bitch they're also yes. trying to kill two birds at one stone and do the video i think it's a dead giveaway okay the lady who was the a director of the video said it was the hardest video she had to do ever do in her life because them motherfuckers did not like each other at all. Wait, what Jody Watley said was that her and Howard Hewitt got into it. She don't remember what it for, okay? Her and Jeffrey Daniels both was like, I'm not going to tape with that nigga. He's too arrogant. I don't like him. And the way that they made it seem was that it was Jeffrey Daniels and Jody Watley against... Howard Hewitt. Unsung said that that was the last time that the three, Jody Watley, Jeffrey Daniels, and Howard Hewitt worked together as a group. That was not true. Jody Watley said that they did do or attempt a reunion. It just did not work for them. Do you guys remember uh, Jermaine Stewart? We don't have to take our clothes off to have a good time. Ooh, I should have known that was a gay man. But anyway, Jermaine Stewart was a background singer for Shalimar. Okay, I never knew that. And one day, Jermaine Stewart had called Jody Wadley and was like, hey baby, where you at? We can ready to go on stage. Where the hell are you? Jody Jody Wadley goes, what, what, are you, what are you talking about, baby? Uh, Howard is here. Okay, we're getting ready to sing. Come to find out that Dick E was booking Howard Hewitt only with the background singers. That's it. So that was another way that Dickie was looking out for Howard Hewitt and throwing in Jody Wiley and Jeffrey Daniels' face that yes, you are replaceable. I thought that was horrific. That, that had to be a painful thing to find out on a humble. She said that you know, she didn't have any problem with Jermaine Stewart. Jermaine Stewart was a good friend to her until his death. Dickie went to her because he fed up. He like, I'm tired of playing these games with you bitches, okay? What you want? You want a solo deal, Jody? Jody say, answer, no. I don't want nothing from you. She was done with the whole group thing. She was tired, okay? I would be too. You know, after learning about all the deception that was happening, that you didn't give me an opportunity to at least be like, okay, I want to participate. I don't want to participate or, you know, something. But to go behind Shalimar's back and just Howard and hire Howard Hewitt and the background singers to perform, Howard Hewitt was touring as Shalimar. So what Jeffrey Daniels said in regards to him leaving the group was he was doing an interview. Okay, and they asked him about Shalimar. He said, Shalimar's dead, it's over. Mm -hmm. So in 1984, Jody Wiley and Jeffrey Daniels walked away to their own solo careers. Okay, so, you know, Dickie, he had to find a replacement because that's what Shalimar is, a replacement group, down to the very beginning, okay? Kind of like Menudo, okay? You just rotate your ass up out of there. All right. But what Dickie did was he found Mickey Free. All right. Mickey Free and Howard Hewitt, they worked well from the very beginning. You know, I guess Howard Hewitt enjoyed uh, Mickey Free's free nature. They said that while they was on tour, they partied like they was rock stars. Maybe that was something that he couldn't do with Jeffrey Daniels and Jody Watley. In regards to the replacement for Jody Watley, they ended up doing a worldwide talent search, which didn't do nothing because they ended up hiring a friend of a friend. So in 1984, Shalimar won their first Grammy for Dancing in the Sheets, all right? In 1984, after that, Howard left. He was ready for his solo career. Now here is where uh, Jody Watley chimes in again 
on her unfiltered episode to say, bullshit. Howard Hewitt ain't just wake up and say, I'm ready to go. No, Shalimar was the vehicle for um, Howard Hewitt's solo career. In fact, they were, they were uh, grooming him for his solo career for a long while. So it wasn't like Howard Hewitt just woke up and been like, okay, I'm ready to go. No. So Mickey Free says that when Howie Hewitt left, it left a void in the group. Dick being a dick, you know, he found another replacement and he replaced Howard Hewitt with one of Shalimar's backup singers, Sidney Justin. Justin okay. said that there was tension in the group before he even got there. Okay, it was like Delia's, the girl who replaced Jody Watley against the dudes. And Jody Watley said that the majority of the tension in the group came from or came as a result of Dick. Because I'm like, how is it that it's the same dynamic with different Team players. Like before, you know, it was like the guys didn't have no respect for Jody, and then here we are again in a whole new cast, and the girl is feeling the same way about the two guys. It's 1987, okay? And we are on the ninth album, Circumstantial Evidence. Answer no. The people wasn't feeling that shit. Answer no. So in 1990, they produced the 10th album, Wake Up. Still, the answer is no. Here we are in 1987. Jody Wally is creating her new album. And we're back to the beginning. Where Jody Wally is receiving her Grammy for Best New Artist. Now, Howie Hewitt also had a successful solo career. And I guess Jeffrey is still on tour, pop locking and backsliding. You know, I, I, I don't know. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share, and subscribe because it is so important to my success here on the YouTube. Now, remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down, naysayers, my patron loves you. Better have a safe and good one.